Hello, I'm Peter Moore. Today we're heading out to sea with the winner of this year's Wolfson History Prize, Professor David Abalafia. Welcome to Travels Through Time, the podcast made in partnership with Jordan Lloyd and Colograph. The Wolfson History Prize is the most valuable history prize in the United Kingdom, with £40,000 being presented each year to the author of a work of history that combines excellence in research and writing. In June this year, the Wolfson History Prize for 2020 was awarded to today's guest, David Abalafia, for his book, The Boundless Sea. A Human History of the Oceans. The book is a sweeping, panoramic, hugely erudite work of history that canters through space and time. It goes from the Atlantic to the Pacific and from the Polynesian voyages right through to the White Star Line. The Wolfson Judge is called a book of deep scholarship, brilliantly written. David Abalafia is Emeritus Professor of Mediterranean History at the University of Cambridge. I caught up with him down the line just after he'd won the prize earlier on this summer. Before we got to our year and our three scenes, I began by asking him a little bit more about the book, a work that surely could only have emerged out of a career's worth of reading. For most of my career, I've been writing actually about the Mediterranean, which was the subject of a sort of parallel volume that came out a few years ago, uh, though I have also written quite a lot about the Atlantic. But these sort of connections, the way in which contacts across the sea, they're not just to do with making profit out of trade. There's also that sort of cultural um, benefit that, that is brought by these contacts. It's something which has always fascinated me. So in that sense, yes, it's a book that sums up years and years of thinking and reading and um, sort of speculating and traveling as well. One of the things that stimulated me to take an interest in the sort of southeast corner of Asia, so what's now Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore, was a conversation with a very distinguished economic historian, uh, Sir Michael Postan, who was then in his 80s, I think, and he'd commissioned me to write an article called Asia, Africa and the Trade of Medieval Europe for a big collection of volumes, the Cambridge Economic History of Europe. So this was looking really at how goods had managed to cross those vast distances from all sorts of directions. I mean, across the Sahara Desert, through the Indian Ocean, across the Eurasian landmass and so on, and what impact they had on medieval Europe, which are absolutely fascinating. I mean, things like the Chinese demand for camphor, or this very strongly smelling substance extracted from camphor trees in the early Middle Ages, which was the sort of making of early medieval Indonesia and Malaysia. And then later on, the history of those great ports, Singapore, which in the 14th century was a really very important centre of trade, and Malacca, which took over from it in the 15th century. I think it's um, in the serendipitous meeting, sitting down next to someone in maybe the college environment or something, that you find, I suppose, enormous um, opportunity. But that must be quite scary as well, because you, you titled the book The Boundless Sea, and I imagine there were times when it felt like the boundless project because it could always um, acquire a new dimension if you if you sat next to the wrong scholar and you were um, provoked in the wrong way. But I think what we get in this great sweeping narrative of yours is a real picture of the world coming together. I know you've lectured and spoken about globalisation quite a lot. Would you say that's the force that's at the heart of the book? It's, of course, a very difficult concept to get one's hands around, and it's used in so many different ways. And then, of course, people also throw in, just to avoid getting stuck in the argument about when globalization begins, they come up with this concept of proto-globalization. So it's something that's sort of a bit like it, but, but not really fully developed. Um, I have 
used the word, I think, really in two ways. Um, used it in a loose way. And I hope I've always explained in what sense I'm using it when I'm talking about contact between civilizations, if we go back to the ancient world, uh, which are separated by quite considerable maritime distances, uh, but are engaging in trade, cultural contact, and so on, sometimes even political contact. So there's that sort of sense of global connections, which really are beginning to affect the way in which one state, empire, city, state, whatever it may be, functions. Uh, economically, politically, socially. Uh, but then there's, of course, the more sort of economist type definition of globalization, uh, which I address much later on in the book, where one might want to look at ways in which, uh, for instance, prices and wages at the other end of the world are to some extent determined by contacts right across the world. And the great sort of case which I address there is the question of the tea trade uh, in the 18th century. When you've got enormous quantities of tea being exported out of China to Europe, to not just to England, Gothenburg in Sweden turns out to be one of the really major centers for the distribution of tea. Not that the Swedes wanted to drink all that tea, the whole point was they redistributed it and a lot of it came to Britain, in fact, uh, and some of it, some of this tea was ending up, as we know, in Boston, where it was thrown in the water in 1773. And there you get the intersection of politics and economics. Yes, yeah. yes exactly. And so, you know, they're, they're very angry at the decision of the British government to, uh, to vary the taxes in a way which was actually, I think, probably rather beneficial to consumers, but I do suggest that. I don't want to wind up my American readers too much. <laughs> So it's that sort of sense that what's happening on one side of the globe has a real direct effect on what's happening on the other side of the globe. Um, so in a sense, what I'm trying to do when I go right back to, for instance, the Sumerians in what is now Iraq and their contact with the inhabitants of the Indus Valley, this extraordinary, very mysterious civilization, the Indus Valley in the third millennium BC, I'm trying really to to show that these contacts between civilizations across the sea, that they really do reach right back to the very earliest period of city building in human history. Yeah, we should get on with our business. But I also wanted to mention quickly before we do that the book opens with perhaps the most enigmatic uh, puzzle in maritime history, which is the Polynesian colonization of the Pacific and an absolutely enormous area, which um, is a subject which continually fascinates me and one that I think makes a wonderful opening to the book. I, I was determined to begin with the Pacific because, uh, I mean, we're looking back millennia, really. I mean, it depends where you want to start. You can start with types of human being different from our own who seem somehow to have got across the water the colonization of Australia, though the Australian population didn't engage with the sea by any means as much as the Polynesians. But it is an extraordinary story which stretches over those millennia right up to perhaps as late as 1800 or even 1350, when New Zealand was settled by Polynesians, the ancestors of the Maori population. So you've got this very long history um, of actually quite gradual movement, obviously, across this vast space, also stretching northwards right up to Hawaii, eastwards to Easter Island, with the possibility that some of these Polynesians did reach South America, though, without any particularly noticeable effect. Um, and always the question of how they did it, I mean, their navigational skills, and why they did it. Which is always, yeah, the most poignant question of all, of why, yes, exactly. So this um, this picture I have of um, one of the Waka pushing out into the Pacific Ocean on a journey that would eventually end in New Zealand, I think, is is a picture which always fascinates me. And that yeah. question, why, trails along in the wake of the of the rowers, I think. But so we I hopefully have painted a bit of a picture of the project, the book, which 
um, I think stretches to a thousand pages and looks in considerable detail, but also on a vast scale at the life of the, or the human interaction with the, um, the oceans of the world. But um, hopefully we're going to do something quite playful and instructive here over the next 45 minutes or so, which is to pin you down a little bit and uh, ask you to look at one, one year in this broad and billowing story and then examine it in the three scenes. So I'm going to ask you the question that I ask of everyone who comes on this podcast. If you could travel back through time to one year, which year would you choose? Well, for this purpose, I'm choosing 1415, uh, which will be familiar perhaps to people conscious of their English history as the year of the Battle of Agincourt. And we're going to go on quite a picaresque journey as well, because we're going to take in quite, a, I, I suppose, a portion of, of, uh, of the globe. And we're going to start where? Where would you like to go to in 1415 I... first? I would like to start in a city on the northern tip of Africa. Uh, I could describe it, I suppose, as a city in Morocco, but it's not actually in Morocco politically. It's I mean, physically, I suppose it is. Uh, the town of Ceuta, um, which is a, a Spanish city nowadays, uh, and which lies directly opposite Gibraltar. It's one of the two pillars of Hercules marking the exit from the Mediterranean into the Atlantic uh, and had been a very important centre of the gold trade caravans coming across the Sahara, uh, been a great cultural centre, uh, but up to 1415 had been under Muslim rule. So, and for very many centuries too, as um, as a terminus for all of this trade, which goes through Central and Western Africa, it's um, maybe worth dwelling for a moment um, on the strategic importance of um, Suta, which is um, the primary reason for its importance. It's a, a very curiously shaped town because it's very long and narrow what you've got is ports on either side. So as you walk down the main street, at a certain point it's so narrow you can look down one side street and you see the sea, I suppose, the Atlantic if you like. Look down side street on the other side, on your right hand side, and you'll see the, the Mediterranean. Having these two harbours was extremely important uh, and it had always been um, a centre therefore from which shipping coming out of the Mediterranean which was a very difficult journey to make because of the winds and the currents and so on, could sort of take refuge, um, stop there a bit, wait for the winds to change, and then edge out into the Atlantic, either down the coast of Africa or up the coast of southern Spain and Portugal. Certainly, if you go back, let's say, to around 1200, it was tremendously important, actually, in the history of Europe. I mean, it may be in Africa, but the Genoese and the Pisans, the great merchants and the Catalans and so on, the great merchants of the Christian world traded there very intensively. And Genoa in particular, which is a city without a hinterland, uh, was drawing great quantities of grain out of Ceuta, uh, grain which had been brought up from the plains around Fez further south in Morocco. But of course, they were also interested in the gold, which came in the form of this gold dust in little packets and was carried all the way from Timbuktu um, and actually was collected further south than that, uh, but carried on the backs of camels. And what we're beginning to see after 1415 is that the Portuguese, and I'll explain why they come into the picture in a moment, but the Portuguese begin to realize that there's no way in which Christian merchants are going to be allowed to penetrate across the Sahara. One or two attempted to do so in the 15th century, but you know they had to sort of wrap themselves up to look like Tuareg uh, and, um, and really sort of hide away. The only way you were actually going to get to the sources of gold was going to be to edge around the coasts of West Africa by sea. 
But that actually raises a question about the motives behind what happened in 1415, mm. which was the Portuguese conquest of Ceuta. Well, there we go. A few things to head directly for. But I suppose before we do, it's, it sounds a bit like a hoary old cliche to say, it, but it is, it is one of these places which is um, a, a meeting of cultures where the, the caravans might meet the Karaks of the... Um, the traders and I presume because of its economic importance which we've sketched there very briefly it must have been a pretty well defended place a well defended place although you know always with this problem of being quite exposed with walls um, on either side and then there's a sort of hill that is the, if you like the pillar of Hercules not nearly as high as as the rock of Gibraltar uh, which uh, was again defended, which had its own castle. So they, they were pretty confident, actually, that people couldn't seize control of it. If you look at its history in the past, various people, the Genoese had tried to capture it in the past. The Catalans always had their eyes on it. Uh, and there was constant to and fro because it was very much linked, very closely linked to the Islamic states in medieval Spain. Um, and at some points was actually ruled from Spain. If you go further back, the caliphs of Cordova in the 10th century. So um, it was almost part of Spain even then, as it is now. I mean, it always had this very close relationship with that flourishing situ uh, civilization in Spain, great cultural center with an enormous number of uh, colleges of Islamic learning, you know, madrasas. Uh, it was very famous for that. So if, um, I, I suppose the listener will know what's coming now, but if the list of suspected belligerents against Suta at this time, would Portugal have been the number one candidate? Did people expect this attack or did it really come as a surprise? It came as a surprise, not least to the Suutans, of course. Um, and uh, that was because the... Um, the, the, the big plan, if you like, in Christian Europe was that the largest of the Hispanic kingdoms, Castile, should be given control ultimately of Morocco. Once, once the peninsula was in Christian hands, Castilian armies would invade Morocco and take control of, of that part of the world, whereas the Aragonese and the Catalans, separate entity or group of entities really, um, from the Castilians, rivals of the Castilians, uh, they, it was generally agreed that they would have the right to conquer what we would now call Algeria and Tunisia. So that sort of division of North Africa between the Christian powers with a view to re-Christianizing the area, with a view to sort of prosecuting a crusade. Once the Portuguese in the 13th century had pushed south and had conquered the Algarve, they no longer had a border with the um, with the Muslims. Um, uh, the Muslims were, after 1250, confined to the Kingdom of Granada, which did not reach up to the Portuguese border. So as far as most people were concerned, the Portuguese were sort of out of the contest for domination over what remained of Muslim Spain. Um, and uh, you know, if, if if there was anybody who was going to attack Ceuta, it had to be the Castilians because Ceuta lay right opposite Gibraltar, which they were also trying to get hold of, but they were pushing further and further south towards the Straits of Gibraltar. Okay, so let's talk about Portugal for a moment then, because we've um, described one half of the picture really, really well. But I know at the start of the 15th century, Portugal's population was probably no more than a million and, it, and its kings were too poor to mint their own gold coins. It was not an affluent place, but it was an ambitious place because there was a new ruling dynasty, I suppose we could say. Do you think that was a, an important element? The, the new dynasty is certainly an important element and seeking to sort of legitimate their authority mm. through some sort of major act uh, which would involve ideally commitment to a crusade against Islam and that's what the attack on Ceuta certainly was. Uh, so that's an important part of it and another very important part which you've actually alluded to is this question of gold. 
it wasn't just in Portugal, actually. I mean, some historians think that around 1400, there was quite a serious shortage of gold coming into Europe. And that raises, again, this question about whether Ceuta was still functioning as one of the major sources of gold for Europeans. Most of the gold minted in Europe, I mean, increasingly, they were finding it also in Hungary and places like that. But most of the gold, certainly in the Mediterranean region, came from uh, sub-Saharan Africa. And gold coinage had, from the middle of the 13th century, circulated more and more widely, first around the Mediterranean and then right across Europe. Uh, so this bullion shortage, which also began to affect silver as well, uh, that had an effect on the economy, obviously, a depressive effect on the economy. And quite apart from that, there's the sort of greed element. I mean, the Portuguese, as you imply, did want to become um, something more than minor players in, in Europe. So we should probably say at this point, what happens on that day? I think it's the 21st of August, something like that, in 1415. Could you sketch what happens, please? Well, the Portuguese managed to cobble together, I, I, I use that word, I think, advisedly, um, quite a large fleet, uh, partly by impounding ships, even English ships, that were in the port of Lisbon. They didn't really have, although Portugal was beginning to, um, to develop quite a significant navy with the help of Italian admirals, they didn't really have enough ships for this major expedition. Um, but uh, off they went, and they kept the uh, destination secret as long as it was possible to do so. So the Castilians, who had their spies at the Portuguese court, uh, and there was a very deep rivalry at this stage. There was real sort of, it went beyond distrust. There was sort of hatred, really. There was a real sense at the Portuguese court that the Castilians were the enemy. I think partly to do with the fact that the new dynasty had had seized power and the Castilians had been supporting the previous dynasty. So the fleet goes off and people begin to speculate, well, will it attack Gibraltar, for instance? And that would have worried the Castilians because, as I've said, Gibraltar was one of their targets. Uh, but no, it headed for Ceuta to everyone's surprise and then the winds turned against the fleet as it approached Ceuta so the ships were blown back and this led the ruler of Ceuta to stand down his guard and to say well you know I think the emergency is over they'd seen this sort of thing before you know. um, but then the winds turned again and the fleet managed to reach Ceuta and to storm the city. And it was quite violent fighting. And in that fighting, at the heart of, 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 of the sort of battles in the streets, there was one particular individual who, still a young man, he'd been very active in pressing for this, this attack to take place. And that was the king's son, one of his younger sons, Prince Henry, whom we know as Henry the Navigator. Mm. Um, and he, when he and the others came back to uh, to Portugal, to Tavira on the Algarve, they went to give thanks in a church, which still stands there, actually. And you can see the monument to the knighting of Prince Henry following the capture of Ceuta. But they were lucky in a way. I mean, you know, the winds turned just at the right time. The, the rule of Ceuta made a misjudgment um, and then they found themselves masters of what had been a great trading city but exactly but this has often been seen by historians as a prelude to these great voyages of portuguese expansion which follow over the pre over the century that comes is that right it is right in the historiography the capture of Ceuta is always seen as the beginning of an imperial process uh, that culminates, you know, with the Portuguese arriving in Macau and Japan and so on. Um, uh, so, you know, a, a process that encompasses the 15th and 16th centuries. Uh, but actually, when one looks at the course of events, it's by no means as simple as that. 
Uh, the reason that this particular interpretation, I think, has held sway for so long is that in the 16th century, a Portuguese poet, the national poet, Luís de Camões, uh, he wrote this, this great epic poem sort of based on sort of Homeric models about the Portuguese conquests. And he began with the capture of Ceuta. So he set that as the starting point. It's yeah. really difficult to sort of get away from, you know, it's as if you know, you're dealing with the Portuguese equivalent of Shakespeare. So it's difficult to get away <laughs> from that. Um, but then there were other objectives too. Uh, there were the Canary Islands, which had been explored by the Portuguese in the middle of the 14th century and by others. So the, the Catalans and the Castilians and even some French um, pioneers later on, people trying to interfere in that area, which had a native population, but uh, seemed to be conquerable, didn't really have many resources, but you know could be a jumping off point to explore West Africa, gain access to gold. Um, and then also what developed was an interest in the uninhabited Atlantic islands, Madeira, the Azores, Madeira became a great centre of the sugar industry, and Prince Henry was involved in founding all of that. So there were a number of different options and Henry oscillated between them. So sometimes during his career, he died in 1460, sometimes he was interested in sending ships down the coast of Africa, hoping to find the legendary Rio de Oro, uh, river of gold, which would give access to the gold supplies. And sometimes he was interested in making himself sort of overlord of the Canaries. And sometimes things reverted back to to Morocco. But in, in the case of Ceuta, of course, they'd discovered something which perhaps they could have predicted, that following the conquest, the merchants all left the city. Uh, the city was depopulated uh, and... Uh, it became a sort of Siberia to which the, uh, the the Portuguese would send criminals, things like this. Later on, they used a lot of their colonies for that sort of purpose. Um, so being sent off to Ceuta became a sort of standard mm. punishment for perhaps misbehaving noblemen, that sort of thing. Which is quite a change. And it lost its economic importance. Yeah. I mean, I, I suppose if we were to characterise this moment, um, I, I suppose in, this is in my terms, I mean, you write that... Uh, the expedition cost a total of 33,600,000 white royal coins, which is a mountain of money. So it seems for a an emerging power like Portugal to be a real roll of the dice, wh however you look at it. Yes, and they found themselves having to support uh, Ceuta, having to you know, supply it with grain, which they sent from the Algarve regularly, things like that. It It remained a drain on Portuguese finances. So I suppose that helps to explain why. I mean, in this sense, you could say the capture of Ceuta is a starting point. It only stimulated still further the search for the sources of gold. Capturing Ceuta had not solved the problem of access to gold, uh, and so they would have to find other ways of getting it. And equally, in order to maximize their income, developing, as I said, the sugar industry on Madeira, developing the Azores as a great center of grain production, dairy production. These were things from which Portugal could benefit uh, economically very, you know, on, on a very large scale. Hi, I'm Artemis. You'll know me as one of the presenters on this podcast. At Travels Through Time, we're incredibly proud to be partnering with Jordan Lloyd, one of the world's leading visual historians. His extraordinary photo colorization work has appeared on the covers of National Geographic, Life and People magazines, and he's worked on special projects for titles like The Times of London and NPR. The quality of his work really has to be seen to be believed. Portraits of Charles Darwin and Abraham Lincoln and sweeping panoramas of the D-Day beaches in June 1944, just to name a few. One of our favourites is a colourised shot of RMS Titanic as she cuts loose from her moorings in Southampton in 1912 to begin her fateful voyage. It's a picture full of narrative power. These images are now available as beautiful prints and they make an unusual and striking present for that friend or family member of yours who loves the past. To find your favourite historical image, have a look at Jordan's site at www.colorgraph.co. And that's colour spelt the American way, C-O-L-O-R, colorgraph.co.
Well, I think that's a really good place to start. And we've got a lot of uh, material to get through. So let's go somewhere a little bit colder. Um, I think that's fair to say than uh, the, the North African coast. Where would you like to go for your second scene? Well, I'd like to go to what's called the Eastern Settlement in Greenland. Now, it wasn't actually on the eastern coast of Greenland, it was on the western coast of Greenland, and so it's really the southern settlement, and then there was a smaller western settlement further north, which was a sort of outpost, really. Uh, and so the eastern settlement, group of little sort of hamlets, really, where Scandinavians, descendants of Vikings who had earlier on colonised Iceland, were still living around 1415. Uh, they'd been there for over 400 years. Uh, and the very interesting question is whether we're looking at a declining community, whether it's being getting more and more cut off from its links with Europe, what that all implies, issues to do with perhaps the freezing of the seas during a cold phase. There are very interesting questions about the state of this community in 1415. Yeah, and immediately what strikes me um, is that it's a kind of opposite to what we were talking about before, which was the beginning of a process where the Portuguese would expand. Whether it was the beginning, of course, we can talk about, but it, it was certainly a process when it was in its infancy. Now in Greenland, we're looking at a tradition of, or a period of history, we should say, of maybe 400 years or so, which is coming towards its end. Is that a right way of characterising it? I think it is. Um, the Greenlanders were complaining that um, ships were not arriving. They were supposed to have ships coming regularly every year from Norway, and the ships were not arriving. Uh, so they were obviously failing to get some of the supplies they needed. Um, the the economy of the Norse settlers in Greenland, it turned very much on pasture. Uh, there was very little capacity to produce grain. Uh, certain products we know, and this comes as a surprise to many people, they were actually acquiring from North America. I'm referring particularly to timber, very large amounts of timber clearly being brought across from northern Canada every year. And that continued right through to this period. They, they had sort of means of making connections, but less and less with Europeans. And it was also a period in which uh, the native Canadian population, mainly Inuits, who were coming down further and further south along the coast of Greenland. So it's a very interesting question to what extent the first the Western settlement, which disappears um, around this time, and then the Eastern settlement are under threat from rivals trying to take over the uh, the Norse territory, if you like. Mm. There's um, probably an aside here, but an important one, which is talking about climatic history, because I think, um, was it not from about the year 800 to 1200, there was a warmer period? I'm not sure if I've got the parameters correct, but it is in, in the context of that, that this expansion happened up into Greenland, but subsequently the um, the climate cools again. Is that correct as a broad description? It's, it's always very difficult to judge these things. And I, mm. I should uh, explain perhaps that one of the ways in which climate change within medieval Europe is measured is by looking at ice cores, things like that, from Greenland. So you've got this problem. I mean, is Greenland typical of the rest, you know, it's not even part of Europe. I mean, geologically, it's part of North America, in fact. There's a lot of uncertainty about all of this, but mm. certainly the argument that by the end of the Middle Ages, we're looking at a colder phase, and during this colder phase, well, there's a reference to the ice increasing, this sort of thing blocking the route for shipping coming from Europe. Uh, this actually did give opportunities to other people because there were those who were prepared to brave the ice and it looks as if English merchants actually around the beginning of the 15th century, end of the 14th century, they were turning up in uh, Iceland and probably Greenland as well and they were looking for codfish by and large. Greenland was particularly important not for 
its fishing industry at this period, it was important for walrus ivory. Mm. And this is where Ceuta sort of comes into the picture. Because uh, it's been argued quite recently by archaeologists that with the increasing involvement of the Europeans in Africa, um, and this would also involve developments of trade routes uh, further along the coast of Africa, access to elephant ivory, which was in terms of quality sort of superior, that this was increasing and demand for walrus ivory was decreasing. So there was just less interest in sending ships to Greenland in order to collect ivory. Uh, but then there's another argument, which has certainly been deployed in relation to Iceland, which is that the walruses were being wiped out. So you know, if there was sort of overfishing, if you like. And the result of that was that in any case, the Norse were unable to produce as much ivory as they had in the past. The Emperor Frederick II in the 13th century, uh, who spent much of his career in Sicily and Italy, uh, he was a passionate falconer. Um, and so you get these Greenland falcons, not just at it, but also being sent on beyond there to the courts of Islamic rulers. He liked to maintain good diplomatic relations with the rulers of Egypt and so on. So mm. these falcons were travelling phenomenal distances. Mind you, it's also been argued recently that he had a cockatoo uh, which had come all the way from Australia or New Guinea or somewhere. So. Oh, well. Wow. Be the talk of the town, I imagine. The yes, yes. Um, I suppose this all adds up to the greater point that we should um, expel from our minds this idea that there's just a very threadbare human presence in Greenland. It had, you know, developed to some point. I mean, there's a bishop of Greenland, isn't there, which I found interesting and I didn't know. And I love this um, insight into the hardiness of the people that you you evoke um, and I know this goes a long way back before 1415 which is a time we're talking about but maybe it speaks more widely to the the kind of people that lived in that environment and coming back to this um, idea of globalization that we spoke about very briefly a while back um, if we're trying to picture the kind of um, character you might imagine well you might encounter up there there, there was at the eastern settlement um, I think um, some excavations of graves recently in the homesteads and they found that there was um, a dress of a 15th century Burgundian fashion and the cut of the clothes you write in the book accords with the 15th century European styles which is interesting in two ways because of course it maybe helps us date the graves and how long um, that settlement endured but it also just redefines what we were talking about before that this was a very linked part of the trading network. Yes, uh, the uh, the costume in question, actually, you can see it in the National Museum in Copenhagen. They have a whole room dedicated to Greenland, to the Norse in Greenland. It's absolutely fascinating material. I mean, ivory objects, all sorts of things. Uh, crozier, so, you know, something across which has been carried by the bishop. Uh, all this sort of thing showing that um, they were trying to live the same sort of life as, I suppose, their... Um, their fellow Norsemen in Iceland lived. And in fact, in some respects, it was an easier life because you know, people always used to say, well, the reason it was called Greenland, it was a sort of estate agent's advertisement, yeah. uh, trying to make it sound a lot better than it really was. But actually, the eastern settlement lay further south on the globe than, um, than Iceland. And it was the particular part of Greenland which was quite green, which had open spaces and which was greener than and had, in many respects, a better climate than the greater part of Iceland. So, uh, you know, this this was a place, it wasn't an uncomfortable place necessarily to live if you didn't mind just you know being in a relatively cold climate. But this evidence that they might have had contact with Europe in the 15th century that although very few ships were coming through, as I've said, there may have been additional ships, ships of the German Hanseatic merchants, ships of uh, English merchants coming out of Bristol. Uh, there, there may well have been visitors coming to Greenland in this period, and one could imagine that they learned about, were brought 
European costumes, things like that. Quite a few people have been suggesting that at a certain point when numbers were very, very low, they either merged with the Inuit population, um, sort of men taking Inuit wives and, and vice versa, or um, possibly migrated across to Labrador. Let's keep going. We've got one more scene and one more part of the world to visit. And do you want to tell us what that is, please? Yes. Now, uh, well, I've taken as the place, Nanjing, uh, near the uh, east coast of central China. Um, and what I'm thinking of there is shipyard around 1415 as a result of the decision of the emperor, the Yongle emperor and one of his successors, to launch a series of seven maritime expeditions which reached right across the Indian Ocean. The famous Ming voyages under Admiral Zheng He, who, um, who took these ships, as I say, all the way, you know, Zanzibar, places like that, uh, people going up into the Red Sea, um, lots of visits to Bengal and Malacca and, um, and, and Aden. Um, so a lot of maritime activity around 1415 taking place in China, which had never previously tried to do this sort of thing. Mm. And after 1434, after the last expedition, never again tried <laughs> to do this sort of thing, you could say, until our own time with the modern Belt and Road Initiative. Mm, they really are one of the most spectacular and strangest episodes in all maritime history. I think that's fair enough to say, yeah. but because I think they've got this sense of glitz, the sense of power, but also there's the enig the enigma as well of, of quite what they were doing, uh, which we can talk about in a moment. Because I know you've got more settled ideas on that, but. Um, should we just consider for a moment um, one of these fleets? What what kind of size uh, are we talking about? How many men and what kind of what kind of goods are they taking on these expeditions? Well, the the number of men. Um, I mean, you get these most fantastic figures: twenty seven thousand. Uh, these would be soldiers as well obviously as a very large sort of diplomatic entourage because because the embassies the chinese embassies in this period uh, were hundreds and hundreds of people anyway um and um hundreds of ships say i mean 450 would be a, a low estimate really um uh, very large ships supposedly so several hundred feet long it you know, what what the Chinese would have been manufacturing there on a riverside site was the sorts of ships that they used along their great rivers. You think of those great rivers, which were really the arteries of medieval China. Hmm. And the Chinese had always, when we talk about the Chinese and ships, actually it's rivers rather and uh, sort of edging around the sea coasts rather than the open sea that centuries had been their major preoccupation. There was a period around the 12th century under the Song Dynasty when they did launch quite a lot of uh, maritime expeditions, but not, I mean, nothing on this scale. I'm talking about mm. trading expeditions. Could I, so, so uh, is, I want to reduce the size, yes. Yeah, <laughs> reduce the size. Were they carefully choreographed displays of soft power? The you know, the equivalent of a shake buying a European football team today and filling it with riches. Is it is that the kind of thing they were trying to do? Or do you think there was more purpose to them than that? The explanations have varied enormously over the years. And, for instance, there's one version in which the Emperor Yongle is trying to find a rival, somebody um, who's competing for his throne, and you know, he's sending ships all over the world to find this one man. Uh, a real sort of needle in a haystack problem. Well, that doesn't really work. Uh, there's the argument that he wanted to get ships to Sri Lanka in order to acquire the Buddha's tooth. Well, the final expedition did actually go to and come back with Buddhist relics, but that doesn't work as an explanation either. I mean, it's something much too specific. 
Um, I think really, and also there were various sort of local rebels. I mean, the ruler of Java was a sort of troublemaker, so sort of keeping him under control. I think that sort of thing actually acts as a sort of clue to mm. the bigger picture, because when you talk of soft power, I think that's really exactly it. That the site, as I say in the book, the site of, it's still a very large fleet, I'm saying, you know, knock off the odd zero, but we're still dealing with a lot of very impressive ships coming and, and ships of a totally different sort to those that one would normally expect to see with their dragon pennants and all these things coming into harbour in a place like Calicut in India um, or Zanzibar, Aden. Um, the impression that that gave of the power and glory of the Middle Kingdom, as the Chinese like to call it, this idea of China as the centre of the world, the greatest kingdom on earth, um, its rulers appointed by heaven, um, as, in a certain sense, global emperors, but also recognizing the practicalities. Because there's something I actually quote here, which I think sort of gives this away. It's, um, it's a document which Yong Le, the emperor himself, produced. And he says, the four seas are too broad to be governed by one person. Mm. To rule requires delegation of powers to the wise and the able, who can participate in government. So it's very much this idea that, uh, all right, the king of Bengal, for instance, who sends him a giraffe even before the expeditions begin. Um, these people, by showing respect, sending tribute and so on, that they will um, um, help to sort of magnify the glory of the Chinese empire. Uh, but not it's not an attempt to impose direct rule. And by the way, it's not also not an attempt to set up a trading network. Um, the Ming dynasty was quite hostile to the sort of recreation of the trading networks that the Song emperors, as I said, had encouraged um, and the Mongols after them. They, uh, they were happy to receive tribute, which had some of the character of a trading relationship. But basically, they um, they discouraged the Chinese from getting involved in long distance trade. But that just makes um, the more the more enticing in a way that the, they were so great in number, so powerful, and they went such distances. And there wasn't necessarily um, the imperial motivation that we would imagine it to be, which um, I think is one um, point of consideration for us today. But the other thing which just fixes them so clearly in in our mind uh, or in our imagination is this almost poetic quality of the idea of a great fleet setting out on a voyage and the wonder of it. I know there's lots. I think a lot of the description comes from the later novel that you talked about, but where they, they talk about their sails loftily unfurled like clouds, day and night yeah. continued their course, rapid like that of a star, traversing the savage waves. I mean, this is this is poetry almost, isn't it? Yes, I mean, there were a couple of contemporary authors who, thank goodness, recorded uh, their experiences, though one of them in particular was much more interested in the geography and describing mm. the towns and coasts of the Indian Ocean. Uh, so there's that side of it. And there are also these very remarkable inscriptions which were left. I mean, um, one of them surviving in uh, a town in Sri Lanka uh, and which recorded uh, Zheng He's voyages. They're, they're particularly remarkable because of the way in which they, uh, you know, sort of dedicate uh, these voyages to a whole different series of gods. Uh, Zheng He himself was of Muslim origin. Mm. Um, and yet he seems to have abandoned Islam effectively. And you find inscriptions to Chinese gods, you find inscriptions uh, in order of, of the Buddhist saints and things like this. It, it's this sort of mixture, a mixture of languages, mixture of religions, which uh, was again a way of sort of projecting the sort of universal authority of the Chinese emperor. Yeah, there's... Um... There's a particularly nice passage that you you write about um, a moment when uh, one of the ships is lit up with St. Elmo's fire, which is 
um, a favourite one of mine. I should n navigate people, if anywhere, to the book to go and read that one. It's a beautiful description um, from the time. But we've obviously roamed a little bit beyond just 1415 yeah. with these, because this is a series of, what, seven voyages? Seven and, voyages, yeah. um, and they were in process at that time. I was trying to find a place in around 1415. Of course, we got the shipyards, but there's also... Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure when this happens, but there's a moment when the fleet arrives in Hormuz. Hormuz? I don't quite know how to... Yeah. Hormuz, yeah. at the gateway of the Persian Gulf. And you write that the interpreter was impressed with the place and took a special interest in the jugglers, acrobats and street magicians, above all by the acrobatic goats that could balance on a couple of poles and dance a jig in the air. Yeah. And of such yeah, things... Well, they, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so these are the contemporary writers, actually. So that's yeah. not from the novel. That that, that uh, really seems to have, to have happened, as far as we know. Oh, that's um, a wonderful and almost detail. had this historic role as the gateway to the Persian Gulf. I mean, the Persian Gulf had rather lost its importance compared mm. to the Red Sea as a channel linking the Indian Ocean to uh, the central islamic lands but it was still i mean it's just an astonishing idea that mm. this big chinese fleet turned up in such a place well it's been beautifully described it's, there's much more of this in the book of course so let's retreat from 1415 back to today but i want to ask you one question before we leave and um if you could bring one tangible object back maybe to have in your cambridge office from this year 1415 is there any talisman that you'd like? Well, um, I, yes, I think, I think probably what I would really like is a piece of Chinese porcelain from mm. uh, Nanjing um, from that period, uh, because uh, the quality of that porcelain that was being produced, and this was one of the objects which really featured very significantly on the Chinese trade routes, whether they were managed by Chinese or Malays or, or whoever it might be, Vietnamese, um, the quantity of, of ceramics, you, you have these shipwrecks which contain half a million pieces of fine Chinese porcelain from this period. So that, that would be, for me, I, I do rather love um, Chinese celadon, that's the uh, the greenware or the famous blue and white which was beginning to come into fashion um, that would be my big choice something uh, to sort of link me across the oceans if you like well it's an excellent choice and i think it's one that you know kind of brings out this world of trade that you've written about as well as ingenuity and the idea of objects turning up in strange places the book the Boundless Sea is a worthy winner of the Wolfson History Prize. Congratulations. I'm really pleased to hear that. I'm even more um, of a pleasure to talk to you about it today. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was me, Peter Moore, talking to Professor David Abalafia, winner of the 2020 Wolfson Prize for History for his book, The Boundless Sea, A Human History of the Oceans. The book's available in hardback right now, and this will shortly be issued in paperback as well. Do check out our website, tttpodcast.com, where you'll find a specific page for this episode. It's filled with extra information about the scenes, the best illustrations we can find, and all of the show notes as well. You can also check out our new timeline there too. 1415 slots in really nicely between last week's episode with Justin Marozzi on 1453 and Luke Papera's on 1325, which is all about the pilgrimage of Mansa Musa to Mecca. It's great fun to scroll through the list and it's the perfect way of finding episodes from your favourite period of history. Over the years, we've built up a wonderful library of history books whilst we've been doing this podcast, and we thought that now would be as good a time as any to give some away to our listeners. So if you would like to win a signed hardback copy of Dan Jones's Crusaders, now's your chance. All you have to do is head to our website and sign up to our mailing list. We're going to randomly pick a name on Friday the 14th of August, and if you sign up to that mailing list, it might just be you who's winning the prize. Good luck. That's it from me for now. We're going to be back with another adventure into the past next Tuesday. Thank you for listening today. 
Till next time, goodbye.